<laughs> hey everyone. Well, I mean, this is definitely a new approach. We got the the Tesla drive-in movie theater, basically. Um, it's good to see everyone. It's a little hard to read the room uh, with, with everyone being in cars, but it's uh, <laughs> it's the only way we could do it. So it, uh, hopefully it's cool, and hopefully you can hear me. Can you guys hear me? Okay. All right, great. All right, well, thanks for coming. Um, I think it's been it's been an incredible year, um, and uh, I'd like to thank you for your support uh, through uh, you know tough times, good times. It's been great. I uh, really appreciate uh, everyone who's uh, uh, put their hard-earned money into Tesla, and uh, you know I, I think it's worked out pretty well. This this has been a, a good year, and I think uh, there's many good years to come. So I'll, I'll go through the. Uh, the, the sort of uh, the shareholder pre presentation, I think, fairly quickly because the the sort of real main event here is Battery Day, so and and the, really I'm I'm just going through a recap of of what's happened over the past uh, year or so. Um, I think starting from uh, you know in terms of our ability to create a factory, uh, the, the uh, you know huge kudos to the Tesla Shanghai team for being able to go from literally a dirt pile to volume production in in uh, 15 months. It's like, damn. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so, and, and I think something that's qu that's really qu quite no noteworthy here is Tesla is the only foreign manufacturer to have a 100% owned factory in China. So this is often uh, uh, not well understood or, or not appreciated, but to have uh, the, the only 100% owned uh, foreign, uh, you know, foreign factory in China is is a really big deal, um, and uh, it's it's paying huge dividends here. So uh, we really wouldn't have the results that we have had this year without the the, the uh, great efforts of the Tesla China team. So I'm super appreciative of that, um, and we'll see the the Shanghai factory continue to scale uh, quite a bit from where it is right now. I think. We, we really could expect that to be, over time, a factory that produces over a million vehicles a year. Yeah, <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. So, volume, we also reached in the past year volume production of the Model Y, and this was the smoothest launch that we've ever had. So, I think we're we're definitely getting better at uh, new vehicle launches and building factories and scaling production. Uh, I, as you've heard me say before, it's the hardest thing is scaling production, especially of a new technology. It's insanely difficult. Uh, ma making a prototype is is relatively easy, and if I think of like what is the real achievement of Tesla in in sort of car company terms, it, it it's like it it wasn't making sort of exciting prototypes. Uh, it it was that Tesla was really the first company in about a century in the U.S the first U.S. company in the U.S. to reach volume production uh, and be sustainably profitable. Like, the, the crazy thing is this, this has really not happened in 100 years. That's the, that's the actual super hard part. Um, and we, we now have uh, four vehicles in volume production, S3, XY. So also the, the toughest joke, uh, I think, maybe ever. Um, it was a very difficult joke to make. Um, <laughs> So we also introduced the lowest cost solar in the US. Uh, it's only $1.49 a watt. Um, and we, we really just simplified the whole chain of the whole value chain. Um, so reduced sales and advertising, um, got rid of a bunch of unnecessary costs, and really uh, are just relying upon the fact that it is, it's, it's just the lowest cost, most efficient solar in the US, uh, providing both uh, retrofit and the solar glass roof, uh, which I think is, is a really great product, a hard product to make work that it will be um, a major product line in the future. And uh, we also got four consecutive quarters of, of gap profitability, which is, was, was very difficult. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and certainly a, a testament to the, the hard work of people at Tesla. Um, I, I mean, to, to do this uh, in, in extremely difficult times against a wide range of adverse circumstances uh, was uh, <laughs> insanely hard, but we got it done. So 
and, and I think we've, we're, the, the future is looking, like, I think, very promising uh, from a, sort of an annual profitability standpoint. So um, in, in order to achieve, in order to, to, to sort of do well financially, you really need economies of scale, um, and you need, ideally, the best technology. And I think we, we had the best technology for a while, but now we are also achieving economies of scale. So, and we're also rapidly improving autonomy, which is um, a massive value add to each car. So, you know, I think the, the, the value of Tesla is gonna be like total, just on the vehicle side, total vehicles produced times the value of autonomy. That's, that's a, a way to think about the future value of Tesla. Um, we also have consistent free cash flow generation. Uh, this is really important for growth. Uh, and and it, a key element here is tightening up the time from when a car is ordered to when it is built and delivered. Um, so for a company that is growing rapidly, it's extremely important to tighten the supply chain and to, to have fr from, when, from when parts arrive, put it into a car very quickly and deliver the car very quickly to the customer. And if, if you can do that inside the, t the, the sort of your kind of a payables timeline, then the, the faster you grow, the more cash you have. Or conversely, if you're unable to do it within your, your payables timeline, uh, the faster you grow, the less money you will have, which is obviously bad um, it's for capital intensive situation. So just tightening up and having the parts move very quickly uh, to the factory, put it in a car, get it to a customer, uh, makes a massive difference to cash flow generation. And I mean, that's why it's extremely important to have a factory uh, in each continent. Um, because if you don't have, at least have a factory in the continent, it is Im impossible to achieve this. So having a factory in China that's able to serve China and then uh, you know, soon uh, many, many, many other countries in the region will be uh, key to us um, uh, tightening that, uh, that total sort of chain of cash flow and, and getting it, essentially the faster we grow, the ha more cash. This is really important. Um, that's also why it's important to have uh, Giga Berlin complete because uh, then we'll have a, a factory in China, a factory, a factory in the U.S., and soon a second factory in the U.S. in Austin, um, and a factory in Europe. Um, and, and I mean, even if you, if for for the for Giga Texas in Austin, uh, even if we had exactly the same cost as in California, it would still be advantageous to to do it there because it's roughly two thirds of the way across the U.S. So uh, we, in terms of delivering cars to the central U.S. and to the East Coast, uh, it's far, it's just faster, costs less. Um, and um, it, it fundamentally improves our economics. So I think this is uh, also maybe something that's not fully appreciated of, of just how important it is to have a factory at least on the continent or, or reasonably close to where the end customers is. So you can tighten that, that, that whole chain. Uh, industry performance, uh, we, we've, um, you know, while the rest of industry is, has gone down, uh, Tesla has gone up. Um, I think this speaks to, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, I'd like to thank all the customers for, for taking a chance on Tesla and, and buying our product and uh, really hope you're enjoying it. Um, this is really, you know, our, our sales, as Elle was saying, really grow by word of mouth. So this is really, I think, a very pure, uh, you know, it's very pure in the sense that it's like, it's, it's growing on the basis of, of existing owners recommending it to, other, to, to, uh, to new customers. This is really, I think a, a good way to grow. Um, so, um, and then it, in 2019 we had 50% growth, um, and I think we'll do r really pretty well in 2020. Um, probably somewhere between 30 to 40% growth, despite uh, a lot of very difficult circumstances. Um, I mean, there's so many, you know, pandemic, wildfires. It, it's like a whole bunch of d difficult uh, production issues. Um, but uh, th thanks to the hard work of the Tesla team and a lot of innovative um, approaches to overcoming issues, uh, we're able to still uh, see significant growth in one of the most difficult, in fact, I'd say probably the, the most difficult year of Tesla's existence. So, and we also published our extended impact report. Um, now Tesla, we, we tr try very hard to do the right thing. Um, if the right thing does not happen, it's just because we we maybe made a mistake or weren't, weren't aware of it, but we, we always try to do the right thing as to the best of our ability. And uh, 
and then we, that we published the extended impact report to show, you know, just a sort of a self-examination of, okay, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Uh, what can we do better in the future? Um, you know, it, we're definitely trying to accomplish the most good, and so, you know, if we, if we occasionally make a mistake, we, we work quickly to uh, fix it and do the right thing. So, you know, it's worth looking at, like, the average life cycle, average life cycle emissions in the U.S., uh, and uh, just how, how much better a Tesla is than, or an electric car, than any other, uh, than any kind of gasoline car. And uh, what we'll talk about in the battery day is also just how much the, the grids around the world, and, and uh, actually, especially in the U.S., are greening. Um, it's, it's actually much faster than I think people realize. Uh, the U.S. is moving towards sustainable energy. And so a as we move more and more to sustainable energy, then effectively you end up building the, the solar factories and the, uh, the uh, car factories themselves with, with solar. Um, over time you do, or, or with sustainable energy, over time you, you'll even mine with, with sustainable energy, and eventually it will, it will get to an effective emissions of zero. So that's where, that's, that's where things will end up. <laughs> yeah. So um, we also have safety at the core of our design. Uh, the, the Tesla cars are the safest cars uh, ever designed. We have the lowest probability of injury of any cars uh, ever tested by the U.S. government, and that's just passive safety. When you add uh, active safety into that, uh, it's even better. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's really, if, if you, you know, if safety is important to you, which obviously, you know, it, it is, uh, the, the, this, the safest car you could drive is a Tesla. So, um, you know, I think people sometimes, uh, some people aren't aware of this, but it's really, you know, safety is paramount. It, it is actually the number one design objective when we build a Tesla is safety. Um, our factories are also becoming safer, and if you look at the sort of accidents per uh, vehicle, total vehicle made, it's dramatically better than in the past, um, and uh, it's already better than industry average, and uh, uh, we're confident we can get it to uh, the best in the, in the auto industry. Uh, autopilot functionality continues to improve. Um, and you can see it in the, you know, the, 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 the safety report that we publish every quarter. Um, it's just getting better and better. Uh, the U.S. average for collisions is, um, you know, at roughly 2.1 per million miles. Uh, and with autopilot engaged, it's 0 0.3. I mean, this is a profound difference. It re really um, massive. And this will get even better. So uh, we're, we're confident that uh, over time we can get the uh, probability of, of, of an accident, especially the probability of, of injury, uh, to uh, a 10 times better than the... Than the uh, the industry average, like an order of magnitude better. So that's just a lot of lives saved and a lot of injuries avoided. So that's a, you know, a huge priority for us. Um, and um, you know, on the autopilot front, uh, I think it's, it's kind of hard for people to judge the progress of, of autopilot. Um, like I, I'm, I'm driving, I, I, as a matter of course, I've always done this, I drive the, the bleeding edge alpha build of autopilot. And so, so I sort of have insight into what is going on. Um, and uh, you know, pr previously, about a couple of years ago, we were, we were kind of stuck in a local maximum. So we were, we were improving, but like the, the, the improvements kind of started tailing off and, not, and just not getting where, where they needed to be. Um, we were, we were I call this sort of getting trapped in a local maximum. Um, and so we had to do a fundamental rewrite of the entire autopilot software stack um, and, and all of the labeling uh, software as well. So we're now um, labeling in 3D uh, video. So this is hugely different from the previously where we were labeling essentially a, a bunch of uh, single images uh, from the eight cameras and they would be labeled um, at different times by different people and some of the, the labels you, you, you literally can't tell what it is you're labeling. Um, so it, it basically made it sort of, in some cases, impossible to label, um, and the labels had a, a lot of errors. Now, uh, with our new labeling tools, uh, we label it in video. So we actually label entire video segments, um, and the system, so, so you get the, basically a surround video uh, thing to label, and uh, with, with the surround video and, and with time. So it's now, it's now taking all, amers, all cameras simultaneously and, and looking at how the images change over time and labeling that. Um, and then 
the sophistication of the neural nets in the car and the overall logic in the car has improved dramatically. Um, I think we'll, we'll hopefully release uh, a private beta of, of autopilot, of the full self-driving version of autopilot in, I think, a month or so. Uh, and then people will, will really uh, understand just the magnitude of the change. It's, it's profound. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so as you'll, you'll see, it's, it's just like a hell of a step change. But because we had to rewrite everything, in labeling software, the, just the entire code base, um, it, took, it, it took us quite a while. Um, and the, the, the sort of new sort of, I call it like 4D in, in the sense that it's uh, th three dimensions plus time. Um, uh, it just it's just taken us a while to rewrite everything. Um, and so, you know, you'll, you'll see what it's like. It's going to be, it's amazing. Um, yeah, it's, it's just uh, it's clearly going to work. Um, you know, Tesla core competencies, we've got engineering, obviously. Um, but also manufacturing. I think manufacturing is uh, underappreciated in general. Um, and uh, and the, the, the difficulty of designing the machine that makes the machine is vastly harder than the machine itself. So, you know, the, the designing, like making a Model 3 or Model Y or Cybertruck prototype is, is really quite trivial compared to uh, designing the factory that makes it. Especially if, you're, if it's new technology and you want to use new manufacturing methods, um, it's just at, at, at least uh, 10 to 100 times harder to do the factory than the prototype. Um, and that's why you see a lot of companies out there or, or startups, they'll, they'll bring out a prototype, but they, they just can't get it over the hump for, um, for manufacturing. Because manufacturing of new technology, especially, is the hardest thing by far. Um, you know, like basically the prototype is somewhere, is at best 10% of the difficulty and probably closer to 1%. Uh, and then software. Um, Tesla is both a hardware and a software company. So um, a huge percentage of our engineers are actually software engineers. And you can think of our car as kind of like a laptop on wheels. Um, and so software is incredibly important. Uh, and so not just actually, not, not just in the, in the car, but also in the, in the factory. So the, the factory software is extremely important. Um, just software in general, these, I mean, these are fundamental. These are the three critical areas that um, are needed to uh, make uh, for an awesome company. So, yeah. So we have, um, now we'll soon have three, fact three new factories, incremental, on, well, we have one already, um, on three different continents, uh, Shanghai. We're expanding the Shanghai with the second phase. Um, Berlin is making rapid progress, um, and Texas is, is making even faster progress. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it, with, with each factory, we're, what we're trying to do is, is also improve the manufacturing technology. So it's, um, you know, in some cases, the, like the Model Y made, at, made in Berlin might look the same, but it actually is made in a much more efficient way. And um, yeah, I'll, we'll talk about that later in the, in the battery uh, presentation. Yeah, we launched Megapack. It's a three megawatt hours all-in-one energy storage solution. So it's, it's, been, it's been great overall. Um, all right, uh, and I think that's basically it, right? All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, uh, thanks everyone uh, for coming and we'll be back in a little bit to uh, go through the battery stuff. And th there's a little bit more, in addition to the battery stuff, we've got a little few extras uh, as well. So I think uh, you'll really like what we have to say on batteries. <laughs> The, 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 battery, the battery stuff we're going to talk about is, is truly revolutionary uh, and essential to, uh, to Tesla's goal. The fundamental, the fundamental good of Tesla, it's like if you look back in history and say, what, what good did Tesla do? Um, the good will be to what, you know, by how many years did we accelerate sustainable energy? That's like the, the true metric of, of, of success. Um, you know, it, it matters if, if sustainable energy happens faster or slower. And, and so that's really like how I think about Tesla and how we should, you know, sort of assess our, our progress. You know, how, by how many years did we accelerate sustainable energy? Um, and the, what we're going to talk about with batteries and, and a few other things uh, will really explain how we're going to make a step change improvement in the acceleration of uh, sustainable energy. Thank you.
Hi folks, that, that was great. We're gonna take a short break before we begin the Battery Day event. So stay tuned. If you're local and here in the audience today, you can feel free to get out of the cars and stretch your legs, but try to stay near the cars because we're gonna begin promptly in a little bit. See you soon.
Hello, everyone. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Thanks, Elon. Oh, hi. I'm Drew Baglino, SVP of Powertrain and Energy Engineering at Tesla, and I'm incredibly excited to talk about what we've been doing at Batteries here at Tesla. Great. Um, so let's see. You've got the clicker. Yeah, I've got the clicker. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's. Let's. Uh, yes. Yeah, I'll take it at first, perhaps. Sure. Um, so. Uh, obviously, the, the the issues we're facing are very serious, uh, you know, with the uh, climate change, and um, we're experiencing these issues on a on a day to day basis. Um, it, it's incredibly important we accelerate the advent of sustainable energy. Uh, time really matters. Uh, this presentation is about accelerating the time to sustainable energy. So, the, the past five years were the hottest on record. Um, we have what looks like a wall for CO2 ppm. Um, it's obviously, you know, this time is not like the past. Uh, it's it's really important that we take action. Um, r running this uh, climate experiment is insane. So, especially when it's just a transitory one, anyway. Yes. We're going to run out of these fossil fuels. Let's just move to the future and not run this experiment any longer. Yeah. Maybe talk a bit louder. You got it. Okay. Um, so anyway, <coughs> the so, so we're, we're, th there is a lot of good news though. Um, uh, uh, the uh, what <coughs> a lot of people may not be aware <coughs> that that wind and solar comprise seventy five percent of new electricity capacity in the U.S. this year. So uh, this is a really major. <coughs> um, so the the grid is the, the grid is going sustainable uh, very, very quickly. Um, now, it's also worth noting that the length of time the power plants last is <coughs> on the order of 25 years. So uh, even if 100% of uh, energy generation was sustainable, it would still take 25 years to convert the grid. Um, <coughs> and, and it's also worth noting that in the past 10 years, uh, power production from coal has dropped in half. So it went from 46% of electricity in 2010 to 23% in 2020. So this is a m massive improvement. So good things are happening on a lot of levels. We just need to go faster. Um, <coughs> so in, in terms of Tesla's contribution, we've, we've delivered over a million electric vehicles, 26 billion um, electric miles driven, uh, and uh, many gigawatt hours of stationary batteries, uh, 17 terawatt hours of solar generated. So. Um, I think s solar is sometimes uh, underweighted at, at, at Tesla, but I c it is a massive part of our future. Um, the three parts of a, s a sustainable energy future are sustainable energy generation, storage, and electric vehicles. So we intend to play a significant role in all three. Uh, so to, achieve, to, to accelerate, the accelerate the transition to sustainable energy, we must produce more uh, EVs that need to be affordable um, and a lot more energy storage. Uh, while building fa factories faster and with fa far less investment. Um, <coughs> so uh, goal number one is a terawatt hour scale battery production. So tera is the new giga. Uh, and a terawatt is a, a thousand times more than a gigawatt. So uh, we used to talk in terms of gigawatts. Uh, in the future, we'll be talking in terms of uh, terawatt hours. So this is... Um, what's needed in order to transition the world to sustainability. Um, yeah, and you can see it's a, we're talking about 100x growth in batteries for electric vehicles to achieve this mission. Um, and we are going to get there, just a matter of how fast, and our intention is to accelerate it. Yeah. You basically need on the order of you know, roughly 10 terawatt hours a year of battery production uh, to transition the, the global fleet of, of vehicles to electric. And the average vehicle lasts 15 years, so we're talking about 150 terawatt hours, give or take, to transition the whole electric, all vehicles of all types, uh, uh, to electric. Yeah, so it's a, it's a lot of batteries, basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, yeah, so, and then on the grid side, uh, we, we have a similar mountain to climb, 1,600 times growth from today's grid batteries to go 100% renewable on the grid and to take all of the existing heating fossil fuel uses in homes and businesses 100% electric. Yeah, and, and this, this number, I think, uh, might grow even more, uh, you know, as the, the world economy 
uh, matures, and as uh, countries with high populations industrialize, uh, we could see this number be even more. But let's say it's like roughly uh, tw 20 uh, to 25 uh, terawatt hours per year sustained uh, for 15 to 25 years to transition the world to uh, renewable. This is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so today's batteries can't scale fast enough. Uh, they're just too small. Um, for Giga, Giga Nevada, um, 150 gigawatt hours per year is like what we probably expect to, to make out of there. But this is really pretty small in the grand scheme of things. That's only 0.15 terawatt hours. And it costs too much. <laughs> so we would need 135 fully built out Nevada gigafactories to achieve 20 terawatt hours a year. It's not scalable enough of a solution. We need a dramatic rethink of the cell manufacturing system to, to scale as fast as we can and should. Yeah, and I think we should view this as, as more than just a question of money. Um, money is sort of like an ethereal thing, but it's really the amount of effort. You have a, a certain amount of, of effort um, you know, in terms of people and machines. And depending on, on how fi efficient that, that effort is, um, you know, f for a given amount of effort, you, you want the most amount of batteries. So it's not just a question of like, well, if we had $2 trillion, you, tomorrow you could make this. It's, it's not that easy. Um, you actually need to organize a massive number of people, build a lot of machines, build the machines that make the machines. Um, and so it's incredibly important to uh, have that effort uh, yield the most number of batteries. So, uh, and, and then goal two, obviously, we need to make uh, more affordable cars. Um, the, uh, you know, I think one of the things that troubles me the most is that we, we don't yet have a truly affordable car, um, and that, that is something that we will make in the future. Uh, but in order to do that, um, we've got to get the cost of batteries down, we've got to make, uh, and we've got to be better at manufacturing, and, and we need to do something about this curve. This cur the curve of, of the cost per kilowatt hour of, of batteries is not improving fast enough. Um, so we, we give the, we've given this a lot of thought over many years uh, to say, okay, how can we radically improve the, the cost per kilowatt hour curve? Um, it, it's been somewhat flattening out, actually, in, in yeah. recent years. So I mean, early growth was promising, but you can see we're kind of plateauing. Yeah. So that's, that's what's motivating us to, to rethink how cells are produced and designed. Yeah, exactly. So, so um, yeah, and... EV market share is growing, but EVs, yeah, aren't still inaccessible to all. Um, it's, it's, and, and you can see, it's, as Drew was saying, it's like starting to flatten out a little bit because uh, the, the rate of improvement of the affordability of cars is just not fast enough. So that's why we got Battery Day. Yeah. To make the best cars in the world, we design vehicles and factories from the ground up. Next. Yeah. <laughs> and now we do this for batteries as well. Yeah. It's weird, the, the slides don't show up quite right. Anyway. Is it, what, what shows up on the screen is not quite what shows up there. Oh, okay. Different. <laughs> yeah, I think it's because that's... Yeah. No, that one's current, supposed to be current. Anyway. So let's get started. We have a plan to have the cost per kilowatt hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a plan that rests on a single innovation, some research project that will never see the light of day. It's a plan that has taken creative engineering and industrialization across every facet of what makes a cell into a battery pack from raw material to the finished thing. And we're going to go through that plan with you today, step by step, and build up how we get to these goals and how we accelerate this transition and make our vehicles and our, our grid batteries more affordable. Yeah. But, I mean, we, we basically thought through every element of the battery, well, almost every element. There are a few more elements that uh, we won't get to today, but we will get to in the future. Yes. So first, before we get too far into it, let's talk about what is in a battery cell. We've got the cap and the, and the can, negative and positive terminals of the cell. When you open that cell, you've got a tab connected to those terminals, what we call the jelly roll, which is the wound electrodes on the inside. Um, you can actually see what this looks like as you unwind it. This is over a meter long in a typical 2170 cell. So it's quite a long wi winding process. Um, and, and you can see the tab still there. Um, and then 
What, to explain what's actually going on here, we've identified we've got anode, cathode, separator, positive and negative terminal. Watch what happens as we, uh, there we go, discharge the cell. Got lithium moving from anode to cathode. And then the reverse, when we charge the cell, anode moving from, uh, lithium moving from cathode to anode across the separator. This is the basic of what makes all lithium ion batteries, whether they're, what, no matter what the form factor is. And when we look at what, what's happened to date, at least in our products, we've moved from the 18650 form factor to the 2170 form factor through great collaboration with our partners, Panasonic, new partners like LG and CATL, and probably others in the future. Yeah. Uh, actually, so a slight note on, on why, why is the one called the 18650, although not on the slide, uh, <laughs> versus the 2170, is that the, the first two digits refer to the diameter, and the second two digits refer to the length. So that, that helps explain why are these weird, what about, what's up with these weird numbers. But the, like nobody could explain to me why, why there was an extra zero. <laughs> um, so, I, so I said, like, okay, well, we're deleting the zero that nobody can explain <laughs> in, in future form factors. So that's why it's technically, it's like the 18650, bizarrely, but going forward, it's the 2170, because we just got rid of the extra zero because it's pointless. <laughs> um, and this was, this was a evolutionary step going from 1865 to 2170 bringing 50% more energy into the cell. But when we look to the ideal cell design, if we were to do it ourselves, uh, we need to go beyond just um, what we're looking at us in front of us and, and study the full, the full spectrum of options. So as you can see, we, we kind of swept the key me figures of merit, how much we can reduce the cost and how much vehicle range increases as we change the outer diameter of the cell. We found a sweet spot somewhere around 46 meters, uh, millimeters. But it's not just about a bigger form factor. Like, anybody could make a bigger form factor. Any fool. Any fool could make a bigger form factor. Uh, there <laughs> are we not any fool? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are problems uh, as you make cells larger. In fact, supercharging and thermals in general become really challenging as you make bigger cells. And this was the challenge that our team uh, set our sights on to overcome. And we did. We came up with this tabless architecture that maybe you've heard about um, that that basically removes the thermal problem from the equation and allows us to go to the absolute lowest cost form factor um, and the simplest manufacturing process. And this is what, this is what we mean when we, when we talk about tabless. It's kind of a beautiful thing. Uh, yeah, that's what these t-shirts mean, but it's very esoteric. It's like nobody could figure it out, but. Yeah, um, we basically took the existing foils, laser patterned them, and enabled dozens of connections into the active material through this shingled spiral you can see. With simpler manufacturing, fewer parts, 50, 50 millimeter versus 250 millimeter electrical path length, uh, which is how we get all the thermal benefits. Yeah, this is important to appreciate. Like basically the, 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 the distance that that electron has to travel, you know, it's, it's just much less. Um, so uh, you actually have a shorter path length in a large tabless, uh, large tabless cell than you have in the smaller cell with tabs. This is a big deal. So even though the, the cell is bigger, it actually has uh, more power. Uh, the power to weight ratio is actually better than the smaller cell with, with, with tabs. This is, uh, you know, again, like, this is quite, quite hard to do. It, so it's, uh, you know, nobody's done it before. Um, so, uh, and it really took a, a tremendous amount of effort uh, w within Tesla engineering to figure out how do we make a freaking tabless cell um, and have it actually work, and and then connect that to the top cap, and it's uh, there's a whole bunch of things that we're you know keeping a little secret sauce here <laughs> that we're not telling everything, um, but uh, sometimes <laughs> what's elegant and simple is still hard, and it, we, we, it took us a lot of trials, but we're we're happy where we ended up. Yeah, I mean everything's simple in, in recollection, you know. After you like uh, simple, everything it's hard until it's discovered, and then it's simple. <laughs> um, so anyway, but it's, there's a uh, there's a lot of really cool things going on. Uh, that that enable uh, tabless and um, uh, it's really you know due to a really great engineering team, Drew and the, and the rest of the team have done amazing work in, in achieving this uh, tabless construction. Um, and it sounds, I think it may sort of sound a bit silly to some people, but it, it, this was this is like if for people that really know cells, this is a massive breakthrough for cylindricals to be able to to get rid of the tabs dramatically simplifies winding and coating. Yeah and has an awesome thermal and performance benefit. 
Yeah, um, that's a, uh, just to be so elaborate on that a bit. It's like when the cell is is going going through the the, the system, the system it, it has to keep stopping where all the tabs are. Yes. So you can't do a you can't do a continuous motion uh, uh, production uh, if you have tabs. You have to keep stopping, and and then there's a rate at which you can start and stop and accelerate again, and and it really slows down the the rate of production. And then sometimes you get the tabs wrong. Um, and you also get lose a little bit of, of, of active area. It's 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 really a huge pain in the ass to have tabs um, yes. from a production standpoint. Yes. Um, and so when we put it all together and go to our new 80 millimeter length, 4680, we call this uh, new cell design. We get five times the energy with six times the power, and enable 16% range increase, just form factor alone. Uh, yeah. So we're, 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 these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. I, I just, I just to, to clarify that when we, when we see these um, plus six, sixteen percent or whatever the, the percentage range increases, these are the amounts due just to that particular innovation. Yes. So we'll list a whole bunch of innovations, and then when you add them up, you get a total uh, improvement in uh, energy density and cost. Uh, but uh, th these numbers are are what refer to just this thing. Yeah, and I want to stress, this is not just a concept or a rendering. We are starting to ramp up manufacturing of these cells at our pilot 10 gigawatt hour production facility just around the corner. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's a video of uh, some of what's going on in the plant. Um, now, I mean, to be clear, it will take about a year to reach the 10 gigawatt hour capacity. Uh, so uh, this is important to appreciate. Like when you build a factory, there's a certain capacity that you design to, and then uh, it takes some period of time to actually achieve that capacity. So I would say it's probably about a year before we get to the 10 gigawatt hour annualized rate uh, with, the, uh, with the pilot plant. And this is just a pilot plant. Uh, the, the, the actual production plants will be more on the order of uh, you know, maybe 200 gigawatt hours, maybe more over time. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but let's stack up everything we just saw at the cell level. So just the cell form factor change enables a 14% dollar per kilowatt hour reduction. Just that cell form factor change. And now that you've been teased on this factory, we're going to go on and, and walk step by step through that factory. And, and discuss a series of, of innovations there. When thinking about the ideal cell factory, we have inspirations uh, behind us in the paper and bottling industry, where from humble beginnings, over a century of innovation has enabled mass scale, continuous motion, unbelievably low manufacturing cost. And when we think about the lithium ion industry, which is really only in its third decade of high volume production, it has so far to go to, to achieve similar scale and simplicity. And that, that was the inspiration that we set out to the team as we thought about how to marry cell design and manufacturing in the best possible factory. And let's talk a little bit about what's in a cell factory. First, there's an electrode process where the active materials are coated into films onto foils. Um, then those foil coated foils are wound in the, in the winding process we just talked about, where if you do have tabs, you have to start and stop a lot. Um, then the, the jelly roll is assembled into the can, sealed, uh, filled with electrolyte, and then sent to formation, where the cell is charged for the first time, and, and where the sort of the electrochemistry is set and the quality of the cell is verified. And we set out at every step of this process to try to take that inspiration we just shaw, showed and, and think about how we make those processes fundamentally better and more scalable. And one of the most important processes is where it all begins, the wet process of the, uh, of the electrode coating. And I, just to give you all a sense of scale, I'm going to walk through what's in that wet process. You've got mixing where the, the powders are mixed with either a water or a solvent, solvents for, for the cathode. Um, that Mix then goes into a large coat and dry oven where the slurry is coated onto the foil. You know, huge ovens, tens of meters long. 
dried, uh, and that solvent then has to be recovered. You can see the solvent recovery system. And then finally, the coated foil is compressed to the final density. And when you're looking at this, you're like, wow, that's a lot of equipment for one step, especially when you consider that little speck next to the coating oven is a person. This is serious, serious iron involved in making batteries. Wouldn't it be great if we could skip that solvent step, which is one of those dig a ditch and then fill it kind of things where you put the solvent in and then take it out and recycle it, and just go straight to dr uh, uh, dry mix to coat. And that's what the dry process really is about. And in the most basic form, you can see it here on a bench top. Literally, powder in into film. As simple as that. I, I mean, it's hard, actually, uh, just to be clear. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, if, if this was easy, everyone would do it. So the, it's not like a dry coating electrode is, is actually uh, easy. It's, it, it's, it's actually very hard to do what appears to be a simple thing. Um, and and it's, it's worth noting, like, um, you know, we did acquire Maxwell as like a little over a year ago, I guess. Um, and, you know, it's certainly a good company and everything, but the, the, the dry coating they had was like, is like sort of I would call proof of concept. Uh, since the acquisition, we've, we've actually uh, revved the, the machine that does the dry coating four times. So we're in re revision four post acquisition of the machine. Um, and there's still a lot of work to do. So I would not say this is like completely in the bag. It's still a lot of work to do. Um, and you know, as you, go, as you scale, go from like bench top to lab to uh, pilot to volume production, uh, there are actually major issues that you encounter at, at every level. It's not like you know, you, you make something work on your on your bench, and bingo! Now you can make a bazillion of, of it. It's, Absolutely, it's insanely difficult to scale up. Um, yeah, and, and, but and, uh, yeah, but if you do scale it up, yeah, what what you saw before becomes this. Yeah, so you can see the motivation: a ten times reduction in footprint, a ten times reduction in energy, and a massive reduction in investment. Um, but as Elon was saying, simple is hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I would like to not say that re right now it's just totally working. It's, it's, it's close to working, <laughs> but it's not, even now, it, at the pilot plant level, it is close to working. Well, I, I can't, I, it's fair to say it probably it does work, but with not a good, with not a high yield. Yeah, so, we're still ironing out the kinks, but we've made tens of thousands yeah. of cells, thousands of kilometers sure. of electrode. I mean, we are on the fourth generation of the equipment, so we've learned a lot along the, along the way. Yeah. I mean, it is super demanding because every atom has its place if you want to deliver the energy density and the cycle life and the supercharging. Yeah. But we're, but we're, we're confident that we will get there, but it yeah. will be a lot of work along the way. Th there's a clear path to success, but a ton of work between here and there. Yeah. So, uh, but this is a, a really profound improvement. Again, for people that know battery uh, manufacturing, this is, a, this is gigantic. Um, We'll probably be on, on machine revision six or seven by the time we do large scale production. Um, the, the rate at which the machines are being improved is, is extremely rapid. Like literally every three or four months is a new rev. Yeah, and beyond the electrode, we, we continue to innovate on every other process step. So let's talk a little bit about uh, assembly, which is next. The key to a high performing assembly line is Accomplishing processes while in motion, continuous motion, uh, and uh, thinking of the line as a highway, max velocity down the highway, no start yeah. and stop, no city driving. Exactly, no st stop lights and traffic lights or anything. You want the highway. I want the highway. Yeah. And together with our internal design team that makes this equipment and designs this equipment, we coupled thinking about how to make the best cell with thinking about how to make the best equipment so that we could accomplish the fastest parts per minute rates on all of these tools. Um, and through all of that development, we were able to get to the point where we can uh, implement assembly lines, one line, 20 gigawatt hours, seven times increase in output per line. And when you're thinking about scalability mm -hmm. and pure effort, having one line be seven X the capability is just effort multiplying. Yeah. So. Yeah, you can sort of think about like the, the sort of the fundamental physics of a factory or something. Like, um, I think it's actually quite a lot like the rocket equation, uh, where uh, you've got basically in the rocket equation you've got your exhaust velocity and then the uh, log of the start to, uh, end masses. So it's basically saying, 
you know, how fast are things going and what percentage of your, the factory volume is doing useful work. And conveyance does not count as useful work. So um, Only the value added steps. Yeah, if you, if you break the factory down into uh, cu cubic meter sections um, and say, uh, or, or smaller, it could be like one, you know, one liter sections, and say, uh, is a majority of this volume doing useful work? You would be astounded at how bad most factories are. They're like maybe two or three percent, including our factory in Fremont. Um, so I, I think it, it's possible to get to at least uh, 10 times that uh, volumetric efficiency. Uh, so more like, you know, 30 percent uh, ish, maybe more. Um, and be 10x better, it, it, which means the factory can be 10 times smaller. Um, and then the other thing is how fast are things going through, through the factory? It's like speed and density. Um, the, the, fa the faster you go, like if a factory that's moving at say twice the speed of another factory is equivalent to two factories, basically. And the, the company that will be successful uh, is the co company that with one factory can accomplish what other companies take two or three or four factories to do. So. This is what we're trying to do here is, is say, okay, how do we, uh, with, with, a f with one factory, achieve what maybe five or even ten factories would normally be required to achieve? And, and the vertical integration with the machine design teams at, you know, Groman and, 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 and Highbar and others allows us to really accomplish that because we don't have all these edge conditions between one piece of equipment and another. We can design the entire machine to be one machine and remove all of these unnecessary steps. Yeah, uh, I mean, t basically Tesla uh, is, is aiming to be the, the best at manufacturing of any company on Earth. Uh, this is the thing that's actually most important in the long run. I think, um, you know, just from a company standpoint and, and from basically um, achieving sustainability as fast as possible, uh, but I think also for long-term competitiveness, um, eventually every, every car company will have long-range electric cars. Um, I, you know, eventually every company will have autonomy I think, but not every company will be uh, great at, at manufacturing. Uh, Tesla will be absolutely head and shoulders above anyone else in manufacturing. That is our goal. <laughs>
so this is 100 gigawatt hours supplemental to uh, what we buy from suppliers. Um, and uh, yeah, essentially, th this, this does like reduce our weighted average cost of a cell because, uh, but, it, but it does it allows us to make a lot more cars and a lot more stationary storage. Um, and, um, and then long term, we're uh, expecting to make on the order of uh, 3,000 gigawatt hours or, or 3 terawatt hours per year. Um, I think we can, you know, I think we've got a good chance of, of achieving this actually before 2030, but I, I'm highly confident that we could do it by, by 2030. When you look at the size of that factory on the previous page, it really shows how enabling all of these advancements are in achieving a three terawatt hour goal by 2030. And not only is all of that manufacturing innovation fantastic for enabling scale, it's also an additional 18% reduction in dollar per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have a manufacturing system. We've got a cell design. What are the active materials we're going to put in that cell design? Let's talk about the anode first. Let's talk about silicon. Why is silicon awesome? It's awesome because it's the most abundant element in the Earth's crust after oxygen, which means it's everywhere. It's sand. Yeah. Um, sand is silicon dioxide. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and it happens to store nine times more lithium than graphite, which is the typical anode material in, in lithium-ion batteries today. So why isn't everybody using it? The re main reason is because the challenge with silicon is that it expands 4x when fully charged with lithium. And basically, all, all of that expansion stress on the particle, the particles start cracking, they start electrically isolating, you lose capacity, the energy retention of the battery starts to fade. And it, it also gums up with a passivation layer that has to keep reforming as the particles expand. Yeah, basically, with, with silicon, the cookie crumbles and gets gooey. <laughs> That's basically what happens. Good analogy. Yeah. Um, and current approaches to solve this, which exist, I mean, we have silicon in, in the cars that you're all in right now, are involved highly engineered, expensive materials uh, in, in the scheme of things. Now, they're still great, and they enable some of the benefits of silicon. They just don't enable all of it, and they're not scalable enough. And you can see some of the things that, that maybe you've heard of, SIO, silicon with, with carbon, or silicon nanowires. I mean, that's kind of the space right now. What we're proposing is a step change in capability and a, and a step change in cost. And what that really is, is to just go to the raw metallurgical silicon itself. Don't engineer the base metal. Just start with that and design for it to expand in how you think of the, the particle in the electrode design and, and how you, you code it. Yeah, I'm not sure if you saw this. Basically, a dollar uh, per kilowatt hour is yep. um, the, the, basically, if, if, you, if, you, if you use simple silicon, it's dramatically less than even the silicon that is currently used in the batteries that are made today. Um, and you can use a lot more of it. The anode would cost, yeah, with this silicon, and the anode costs a dollar and 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Yeah. Um, and how does it work? Start with raw metallurgical silicon, stabilize the surface with an elastic ion conducting polymer coating that is uh, applied through a very scalable approach. Um, no, no, no like chemical vapor deposition, no highly engineered high, high capex solutions. And then integrated in the electrode through a robust network formed out of a highly elastic binder. Um, and in the end, by leveraging this silicon to its potential, we can increase the range of our vehicles by an additional 20%, just this uh, improvement. Yeah, it gets cheaper and longer range. Yeah, and, and when we take that anode cost reduction, we're looking at another 5% dollar per kilo, kilowatt hour reduction at the battery pack level. And there's more. <laughs> Let's talk about cathodes. What is a battery cathode? Cathodes are like bookshelves where the metal, you know, the nickel, the cobalt, the manganese, or aluminum is like the shelf, and the lithium is the book. And really, what sets apart these different metals is how many books of lithium they can fit on the shelves and how sturdy the shelves are. Cobalt uh, is a... Per per yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, like, it's, it's tough to exactly figure out what the right analogy is to explain uh, cathode and, and anode, but a bookshelf is probably a pretty good one. Um, in the sense that um, you, you, need, you need a stable structure uh, to contain the ions. Um, so you want a structure that does not uh, crumble or get gooey or basically that, that holds its shape in both the cathode and the anode. Uh, as you're moving these ions, ions back and forth, 
uh, you, you, it needs to retain its structure. Uh, so uh, if it doesn't retain its structure, then you lose cycle life and your battery capacity drops very quickly. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and I think people are always talking about like, oh, what's the cathode going to be? Is it NCA or whatever? You know, the thing to consider is just fundamentally what the nickel, the, the, the metals are capable of. And that's what we have on the chart here. Dollar per kilowatt hour cathode of just the metal using just LME, you know, London Metal Exchange prices um, versus the energy density of just the cathode. And you can see nickel is the cheapest and the highest energy density. And that's why increasing nickel is a goal of ours and really everybody's in the energy and in, in the uh, battery industry. Um, but one of the reasons why cobalt is even used at all is because it is a very stable bookshelf. And the challenge with going to pure nickel is stabilizing that bookshelf with only nickel. And that's what we've been working on with our high nickel co cathode development, which has zero cobalt in it, leveraging novel coatings and dop novel coatings and dopants. Uh, we can get a 15% reduction in cathode dollar per kilowatt hour. Yeah. <laughs> Big deal. But it's not just about nickel. You want to? Yeah, sure. Um, so in, in order to scale, uh, we really need to make sure that we're not constrained by total nickel availability. Um, I actually spoke with uh, the CEOs of the biggest mining companies in the world and said, w uh, please make more nickel. <laughs> it's very important. Um, and so th I think they are going to make more nickel. Uh, but uh, it, I, there's also, uh, it, uh, I think we need to have a, a, a kind of a three-tiered approach to, to batteries. Um, so starting with iron, that's kind of like a medium range. And then nickel manganese as sort of a medium plus uh, intermediate. Um, and then a high nickel for long range applications like Cybertruck and uh, the semi. Um, something like a, like a semi truck, it's extremely important to have a uh, high energy density uh, in order to get long range. So, um, and, and uh, just to give sort of iron a, a bit um, more time, like the, uh, although the, you know, if you look at the uh, white ounce per kilogram uh, at the cathode level of, um, of iron, uh, it looks like nickel's twice as good. Uh, but when you fully considered at the pack level everything else taken into account, uh, nickel is about maybe 50 or 60 percent better than uh, uh, than iron. So I iron is not is little better than it would seem when you t when you look at it at the uh, the pack level fully considered. Um, it's still, it's not as good as nickel. Nickel is like 50 to 60 percent better, uh, but it's still pr it's actually pretty good. Um, and so, you know, g good for stationary storage and for uh, medium range applications uh, where energy density is not paramount. And then, like I said, for intermediate, uh, it's kind of a nickel manganese. Um, and it's uh, relatively straightforward to do a cathode that's uh, two thirds nickel, one third manganese, uh, which would then allow uh, us to make 50% more uh, cell volume uh, with the same amount of nickel. And with very little energy trade off. I mean, yeah. Just enough to, to, to have you still want to use 100% nickel for something like a, a semi truck, but, but really not much of a sacrifice at all. Yeah. Um, and, you know, beyond the metals, because a lot of people spend time talking about the metals, actually the cathode process itself is a big target. 35% of the cathode dollar per kilowatt hour is just in mo transferring it into its final form. And so we see that as a big target, and we, we decided to take that on. Um, Here's a view of the traditional cathode process. Effectively, uh -huh. if you start at the left and you have the metal from the, the mine, the first thing that happens is the metal from the mine is changed into an intermediate thing called a metal sulfate, because that's just happened to be what chemists wanted a long time ago. And then, you, and then when you're making the cathode, you have to take this intermediate thing called a metal sulfate, add chemicals, add a whole bunch of water, a whole bunch of stuff happens in the middle, and at the end, you get that little bit of cathode and a whole bunch of wastewater and byproducts. Yeah, it's, it's insanely complicated. Uh, if, you, if you look at the total, like if you're just like, you know, it's a small world journey of uh, I am a nickel atom, what happens to me? And it's like, it's crazy. Like you're going around the world three times, it's, there's like the moral equivalent of like digging the ditch, filling the ditch, and digging the ditch again. <laughs> uh, it's total madness, basically. Um, and these things just grew up as just, a, they're just kind of like legacy things that, uh, it's like how it was done before, and then they connected the dots, uh, but really didn't think of the whole thing from like a first principle standpoint, saying how do we get from uh, the nickel ore in the ground to the finished nickel product for a battery. Uh, and so we've, we've looked at the entire value chain and said how can we make this as simple as possible. 
And that's what we're proposing here with our process. As you can see, a whole, less, a whole lot less is going on here. We get rid of the intermediate, metal water, final pro product cathode, recirculate the water, no waste water at all. And when you summarize all of that, it's the 66% reduction in CapEx investment, a 76% reduction in process cost, and zero waste water. Much more scalable solution. Yeah. And then when you think about the fact that now we're actually just directly consuming the raw metal nickel powder, it dramatically simplifies the metal refining part of the whole process. So we can eliminate billions in battery grade nickel intermediate production. It's not needed at all. Yeah. Um, and uh, we can also use that same process we showed on the previous page to directly consume the metal powder coming out of recycled electric vehicle and grid storage batteries. So this process enables both simpler mining and simpler recycling. Um, and now that we have this process, obviously we're going to go and start building our own cathode facility in North America and leveraging all of the North American resources that exist for nickel and lithium. And just doing that, just localizing our cathode supply chain and production, we can reduce miles traveled by all the materials that end up in the cathode by 80%, which is huge for cost. Yeah, I mean, c c to be clear, cathode production would be part of our the, te the Tesla cell production plant. So it would just be, you know, basically, you know, uh, raw materials coming from the mine, and uh, from raw materials in the mine, out comes a battery. And on that note, the way the lithium ends up in the cell is through the cathode, so then we should obviously on-site lithium conversion as well, which is what we will do using a new process that we're going to pioneer. That's a sulfate-free process again, skip the intermediate. 33% um, reduction in lithium cost, 100% electric facility co-located with the cathode plant. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's important to note that there is a massive amount of lithium on Earth. Um, yeah. So uh, lithium is not like oil. There's a, a massive amount of it pretty much everywhere. Um, so, uh, in fact, there's, there's enough um, lithium in the United States to convert the entire United States fleet to electric. It's like the, all the cars in the United States, all, there's like 300 million or something like that. Uh, every vehicle in the United States can be converted to electric using only lithium that is available in the United States. Discovered today. Well, that, yeah, what we already know is exists. People really this, haven't even been looking. Yeah, people haven't even been trying because it's just like widely available. So. Yeah. Um, uh, but it, it is important to say, like, okay, what is the smartest way to uh, take the ore and uh, extract the lithium and, and do so in an environmentally friendly way? Um, and w we actually discovered a, again, looking at a sort of first principles physics standpoint, um, in, instead of just the way it's always been done, um, is w we found that uh, we can actually use table salt, uh, sodium chloride, uh, to uh, basically ex extract the lithium from the ore. Um, and uh, th this is, nobody's done this before, I, to the best of my knowledge, nobody's done this. Um, and it's a, a, a sort of, you know, all the elements are reusable. It's a, a very sustainable way of, of obtaining lithium. Um, and we actually, uh, uh, we, 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 we actually got uh, rights to a, a lithium clay deposit in Nevada. Over um, 10,000 acres. Over 10,000 acres. Um, and then the, the nature of the mining is actually, I think, also very environmentally uh, sensitive in that we, we, we sort of take a chunk of dirt out of the ground, or remove the lithium, and then put the chunk of dirt back where it was. So it will look pretty much the same as before, uh, and it will not look like terrible, and yeah, it'll be nice. <laughs> nice. <Yeah. laughs> so Simply mix clay with salt, put it in water, salt comes out with the lithium, done. I yeah, mean, it's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're really excited about this, and, and there really is enough lithium in Nevada alone to electrify the entire U.S. fleet. Yeah, I think that's true. Actually, just what's in Nevada. That's, uh, that's basically so much damn lithium on Earth, it's crazy. <laughs> um, it's one of the most common elements on the planet. Um, and eventually, as we said at the beginning, when we get to this steady state 20 terawatt hours per year of production, we will tr transfer the entire non-renewable fleet of both power plants, home heating and, 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 batter and, and industry heating, and, v and vehicles to electric. And at that point, we have an awesome resource in those batteries to recycle to make new batteries. So we don't need to do any more mining at that point. And you can see why. Yeah. R r the, the, the difference in the, the value of the, of the material coming back from the vehicle versus the ground, you'd always go to the vehicle. And we recycle 100% of our vehicle batteries today. 
And actually, we are starting our pilot full-scale recycling production uh, at Gigafactory Reno next quarter to, to continue to develop this process as, as our recycling returns grow. Yeah, I mean, to date it's been done by third parties, but uh, we think we can, we can recycle the, the batteries more effectively, especially since, uh, you know, we, we kn our batteries, we're making the same battery as the thing we're recycling. So, uh, whereas, like, third-party recyclers have to consider batteries of all kinds. Yeah. And, and, and just to think about what this actually means, the recycling resource is always 10 or greater years delayed because batteries last a really long time. But eventually, it is the way that, that all resources will be made available, and that's why we're investing in this recycling facility at, in Nevada. Yeah. Long-term, new batteries will come from old batteries uh, once the fleet reaches steady state. Right. Okay. So we just talked about scaling cathode and recycling. All of the benefits that you just saw are added to this benefit of a 12% reduction in dollars per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level. Almost at our have the cost goal, but there's one more section. Take it away, Elon. Oh, so um, th there's an architecture that um, we've been wanting to do with Tesla for a long time, uh, and we're finally we finally figured it out. <laughs> um, and I think it's it's the way that all electric cars in the future will ultimately be made. Uh, it's the right way to, right way to do things. Um, so it's, it starts with uh, having a single piece casting or a single piece casting for the front body and the rear body. Um, and uh, in order to do this, we uh, commissioned the, the largest casting machine that has ever been made. And it's currently working just uh, over the road at our uh, Fremont plant. Uh, we have the, 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 it's pretty sweet. Um, ma making the uh, entire, currently making the entire uh, rear section of the car in a, as a single piece high pressure die cast aluminum. Um, and in order to do this, we actually uh, had to develop our own alloy uh, because we wanted a high strength casting alloy that not, did not require coatings or heat treatment. Uh, this is a big deal for, for castings, especially with a, la a large casting. If you heat treat it afterwards, it, it tends to deform. It kind of like does this like potato chip thing. So it's very hard to keep a large casting uh, to have its shape. Um, so in order to achieve this, th there was no alloy that existed that could do this. So we developed our own alloy, a special alloy of aluminum that has high strength without heat treat and, and is very castable. Uh, so that's a you know a, a great achievement of our materials team. Um, in fact, in general, we've got a lot of advanced materials coming for for Tesla that new alloys and, and materials that have never existed before. So. Uh, so you're basically making this, the, the, the front and rear of the car as a single piece. Um, and then that, that, that then inter the interfaces to uh, what we call it the structural battery, where the battery for the first time will have dual use. Uh, the battery will both have the use as an energy device and as structure. This, this is absolutely the way things are done. In, in the early days of, of aircraft, they would carry the fuel tanks as cargo. So the, the fuel tanks um, actually had, were quite difficult to, to carry. They were like basically worse than cargo. You had to, had to kind of bolt them down. Um, it was very difficult. Uh, and then somebody said, hey, what if we just make the wing tanks, uh, what, what if we just make the fuel tank in wing shape? So uh, all modern airplanes, the fuel tank, your, your wing is just a, a, a fuel tank in wing shape. This is absolutely the way to do it. Um, and then the, the, the fuel tank serves as dual structure, um, and it's, not, it's no longer cargo. It's, it's fundamental to the structure of the aircraft. This was a major breakthrough. Um, we're doing the same for cars. So, so, so this is really quite profound. Uh, the, effectively, the, the non-cell portion of the battery has negative mass. So it, we, we save so much mass in the rest of the vehicle. We, we save more mass in the rest of the vehicle than the non-cell portion of the battery. So it's like, well, how, how do you really minimize the mass of a battery? Make it negative. Make the battery non-cell portion of the battery pack negative. Um, so um, it, it also allows us to pack the cells more densely because we do not have uh, intermediate structure in the battery pack. So instead of having these, like, uh, supports and stabilizers and stringers and structural elements in the battery, we now have a lot more space in the battery because the pack itself is structural. Um, the, and what we do is essentially, um, like, what we, like 
we, instead of having just um, a filler that is a flame retardant, which is currently what is is in the 3NY battery packs, we have a filler that is a, a structural adhesive, um, as well as flame retardant. So it effectively glues the cells to the top and bottom sheet. And this allows you to do shear transfer between the upper and lower sheet. Just like uh, if you have like a Formula One uh, craft or like a, a racing boat, and you have uh, carbon fiber face sheets and say aluminum honeycomb between them, uh, this uh, gives you incredible stiffness. Um, and it's really the way that, that any super fast thing works is uh, you, you, you create a, um, basically a, a, a honeycomb sandwich with, with two uh, face sheets. Uh, this is actually even better than what aircraft do, because aircraft do not do this. Um, they, they can't do this because fuel is liquid. So <laughs> in our case, the batteries are solid. So we can actually use the, sh the, the steel shell case of the battery to transfer uh, sh uh, shear from the upper and lower face sheet, which makes for an incredibly stiff structure, even stiffer than a regular car. Yeah. In, in fact, if this was, if, if this was an, in a, uh, in a, uh, like a, a convertible uh, that had no upper structure, it would be stiffer than, that convertible would be stiffer than a regular car. So this is, it's just really, to ha ha it's a pro really major. Um, so it improves the mass efficiency of the battery. Um, and then the, those castings are also quite important because you want to transfer load into the structural battery pack uh, in a very smooth, continuous way. Um, so you don't um, put uh, arbitrary point loads into the battery. Um, so you, you kind of have to, you, you want to sort of feather the load out from the front and rear uh, into the structural battery. Um, it also allows us to uh, use, uh, to, to move the, the cells uh, closer to the center of the, of the car. Um, because we don't have the, 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 in the top one, we've got that sort of all the supports and stuff. So the, the volumetric efficiency of the structural pack is, is much better than a non-structural pack. And we actually bring the cells closer to the center. Um, and uh, because they're closer to the center, the, uh, it reduces the probability of, uh, of a side impact uh, potentially contacting the cells. Because they have, it has to go, in, any kind of side impact has to go further in order to reach the cells. Uh, it also proves... Uh, what's called the polar moment of inertia, uh, which is that uh, you can think of like when there's a like uh, ice skater uh, arms out or arms in. Arms in, you rotate faster. So if you can uh, bring things closer to the center, you reduce the polar moment of inertia, and that means you can you, the car maneuvers better. It just feels better. You don't want to know why, but it just it just feels more agile. So it, it's it's really cool. This is really major. Um, like I said, it's a, so 10 percent mass reduction in, in the body of the car. 14% range increase, uh, 370 fewer parts. So, I mean, I, I really think that, that long term, in any cars that do not uh, take this architecture will not be competitive. And it's not just at the product level a better product, um, but in the factory, it's a massive simplification. You saw the part removal, um, you know, it's casting machines, it's the structural battery pack. So we're looking at over 50% reduction in investment per gigawatt hour, 35% reduction in floor space, and we'll continue to improve that as we make the vehicle factory of the future. Yeah, so it's major improvements on, on all fronts from the cell all the way to the, the vehicle. Um, and in addition to the improvements we just said on enabling additional range and improving the structural performance of the vehicle, it is worth another 7% dollar per kilowatt hour reduction at the battery pack level, bringing our total reductions now to 56% dollars per kilowatt hour. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so stacking it up. We're not just talking about uh, cost or range. We've got to look at all the facets. So range increase, we're unlocking up to 54% increase in range for our vehicles and energy density for our energy products. 56% uh, reduction in dollars per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level, and a 69% reduction in investment per gigawatt hour, which is the true enabler when we talk back about how do we achieve this scale problem here. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, so um, I think it's pretty nice that investment per kilowatt per gigawatt hour reduction is 69%. I mean, who would have thought? Yeah. <laughs> Just happened to happen <laughs> out that way. Yeah. I mean, 0.420%, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so w what, what this uh, enables uh, us to do is achieve a new trajectory in the reduction of, of uh, 
sell cost. And um, now, to, to be clear, it will take us probably a year to 18 months to start realizing these, uh, these advantages. And probably to fully realize the advantages, probably it's about three years or thereabouts. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's not like uh, if we could do this instantly, we would. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's really, um, I think what this bodes, for, it just really bodes well for the future and means that the long-term scaling of, of Tesla and, and, and uh, the sustainable energy products that we make will be uh, massively increased. So, uh, you know, what tends to happen as companies get bigger as things tend to slow down, um, well, actually they're going to speed up. And they have to speed up if we're going to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. Yeah. I mean, long term, we, you know, we want to try to uh, replace about, you know, uh, at least 1% of the total vehicle fleet on Earth, which is about 2 billion vehicles. So long term, we want to try to make about 20 million vehicles a year. <laughs> but I think it's important to point out that when we talked about three terawatt hours by 2030, the problem is a 20 terawatt hour problem. So everybody needs to be uh, accelerating their efforts to accomplish these objectives. Doesn't matter where you are in the value chain, there is a ton to do. You need to rethink from first principles how you do it so that you can scale to meet all of our objectives. Yep. And Elon? Uh, sure. What does this mean? Uh, what, does it mean for, what, does this, what does this mean for our future products? Uh, so, uh, we, you know, we're, we're confident that long term we can design and, and manufacture a, a, a compelling $25,000 electric vehicle. Um, so, you, you know, this, this, uh, this has always been our dream from the beginning of the company. I even like wrote a blog piece about it um, because, um, you know, our first car was, was an expensive sports car and, and then, it was, then it was like slightly less expensive sedan and then finally sort of a... I don't know, mass market premium, but uh, you know, like the Model 3 and Model Y. Um, but it really it was always our goal to try to make an affordable electric car. And um, I think probably, uh, w w yeah, like I said, about, about three years from now, uh, we're confident we can make a very, com uh, uh, very compelling $25,000 electric vehicle uh, that's also fully autonomous. And when you think about the $25,000 price point, you have to consider how much, mo in it, how much less expensive it is to own an electric vehicle. Yeah. So yeah. actually, it it's, it it becomes even more affordable at that twenty-five thousand dollars price point. Yeah. So we have uh, and extreme performance and range, um, and uh, we should probably talk about uh, the you know Model S Plaid. You know what about that? Yeah. Woo. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, we, we we took the la latest plat out to Laguna Seca on Sunday. It got um, a minute thirty, um, and uh, we think probably there's another three seconds or more to take off that time. Uh, so uh, we're confident the Model S plat will achieve the uh, the best track time of any production vehicle ever, of any kind, two door or otherwise. Um, and you can order it now, uh, and it's uh, <laughs> available uh, uh, basically end of next year. So, and now we'll move to Q&A. Absolutely. So we'll invite, we'll invite a few people on stage. 